Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. I know it's Autumn Quarter, I know we're in October and it's autumn, but it just doesn't feel like it. I'm from the East Coast. You may remember when I introduced the middle of the three Reconstruction Amendments, I said that the 14th was the tricksiest of the amendments. I found it's easy to lose track of 14th Amendment Supreme Court cases when they're buried in with other history. The 14th Amendment is absolutely critical to rights and freedoms that we take for granted on a daily basis. But interpretations of the 14th have been notoriously hmm, interpretive and changeable. So I've decided to pull the 14th Amendment out and look at decisions made using the 14th Amendment between its ratification in 1868 through to the pre-World War I era. This means that this mini module covers the extended period of both modules B and C. Rather than the usual outline, I've given you a list of the cases I will cover in this lecture and their generally accepted meaning, given that some of these have already been reinterpreted and others have been sort of taken for granted. One of the big themes of second half American history, in other words, 17b, is the expansion of everything, including the role, size, and complexity of the federal government. As I go through these cases, Think about the changes happening on the ground that you've learned about so far. As a quick review, Congress had already been developing the 14th Amendment when they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866. They were under no illusions that white Southerners were going to comply with civil rights for Black Americans. Released in 1866, but not ratified by enough states to pass, until two years later, the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is said to guarantee birthright citizenship and equal protection of the laws. There are four main parts of the 14th Amendment that I gave you before. We're only going to be concerned with the first two of these in this lecture, C citizenship rights and equal protection. This is section one of the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of the law, and I should have highlighted that last part, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Note that states cannot mess with the rights of citizens, but citizens in the state who happen to have greater social and economic power are not literally held back here. They're not literally written in. Section two basically says that if a state restricts the right to vote, it will get fewer representatives in Congress. And for this one, I won't read the whole thing, just the highlighted parts. Representatives shall be apportioned, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. When the right to vote is denied any male, representation shall be reduced. Note that Indians do not count as full citizens with representation in the federal government. Now that you have had Lecture 7 for context, I can expand on this more by saying that if Native Americans accepted assimilation on the terms of the U.S. government to white America, especially in terms of embracing individualism over communal responsibility, these Native Americans were taxed and could vote just not for Native Americans. And many of you may remember that this is the first time that the word male is specified in the U.S. Constitution and that this was a deliberate omission. Here we have 14 April 1873, the slaughterhouse cases. The slaughterhouse cases show the difficulty fairly immediately 
in this case of interpreting laws with one thing clearly in mind, but written to try to apply over as yet unforeseen circumstances. The Supreme Court's decision in the slaughterhouse cases was its first major decision interpreting the 14th Amendment. The plaintiffs, an association of white butchers in New Orleans, sued the defendant after Louisiana gave the defendant, Crescent City Livestock Landing and Slaughterhouse Company, a monopoly over the slaughtering business in New Orleans. Now, Louisiana did this because the blood and other waste associated with the current slaughterhouses was going directly into the water supply of New Orleans. The newly built Crescent City facility was situated so that its waste did not pollute the New Orleans water supply. The agreement was that Crescent City would rent space to other butchers so that there would not be a full monopoly. The plaintiffs argued that forcing the butchers to give up their businesses and operate in the defendant's slaughterhouse was, quote, involuntary servitude under the 13th Amendment, and that it violated their, quote, privileges or immunities as U.S. citizens under the 14th Amendment, including the right to earn a living in an ordinary calling of their choosing. They also argued that it violated their rights to due process and equal protection. The Supreme Court rejected the butcher's challenge and upheld the Louisiana law. The court held that the 13th Amendment did not apply because it was addressed only to actual slavery. That part of the decision is fairly straightforward. But the court also ruled that in the case of the 14th Amendment, the Privileges or Immunities Clause applied only to federal citizenship rights, not to state citizenship rights. They made those things separate things. This holding or ruling had the effect of dramatically narrowing the application of the 14th Amendment, especially the Privileges and Immunities Clause. The devil is in the details of how the court made their decision, which reads, in part, that a decision in favor of the plaintiffs, the polluting butchers, would have, and the highlighted part here, would have the effect of so great a departure from the structure and spirit of our institutions is to fetter and degrade the state governments by subjecting them to the control of Congress. So the issue here was one of federal power. The fifth section of the 14th Amendment that I've not mentioned so far read that Congress had the power to enforce the 14th, but the court in the slaughterhouse cases decided that only meant in the instance of Black citizens. Note that the exclusions from federal protection decided here would apply not only to the white butchers of New Orleans, but also to Asian Americans. This interpretation of the 14th Amendment would be overruled, but not until 1937. 1876, U.S. versus Cruikshank. The Cruikshank decision came in the wake of one of the bloodiest instances, which is saying something, of white racial violence during Reconstruction, the Colfax Massacre. In 1873, an armed mob of white Louisiana Democrats attacked a courthouse that was held by newly elected Republican office holders, most of them Black. More than 100 African Americans were killed, many while fleeing or surrendering. You will see this, the Colfax Massacre, like the massacre of Chinese coal miners called a riot, the Colfax Riot, as if there were two equal sides. That was very much not the case. The Evansville Journal article that you see up here that I put on the slide got it right at the time and called it a massacre. Prosecutors managed to get convictions for murder and conspiracy for only three of the white men involved in the mob. Those men then appealed to the Supreme Court, and things got worse. You may recall that I pointed out the wording of no state shall when I introduced Section 1 of the 14th Amendment initially and also earlier in this lecture. 
And we've seen that the slaughterhouse decision had already begun to chip away at federal enforcement of 14th Amendment rights. The text in the box below here is a small but critically important extract from the extremely long Crookshank decision. The government of the United States, although it is within the scope of its powers, supreme and beyond the states, can neither grant nor secure to its citizens rights or privileges which are not expressly or by implication placed under its jurisdiction. All that cannot be so granted or secured are left to the exclusive protection of the states. So the argument here was if the men in the mob were to be convicted, tried, it could only be because they broke state laws. The upshot of this was that the Supreme Court granted the appeal, releasing the three white men from responsibility for any of the dead in the massacre, and ruled that the Reconstruction Amendments gave Congress power to outlaw acts of discrimination only by st state governments, not private individuals. The U.S. Supreme Court doubled down on this interpretation when, in the Civil Rights cases of 1883, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the anti-discrimination strictures of the Civil Rights Act of 1875 were unconstitutional. What this meant on the ground was that unless a state made anti-discrimination laws, and we know that the reverse was true in the South, discrimination by anyone else was A-OK. -okay. The civil rights cases of 1883 were a group of five cases consolidated by the Supreme Court because of their similarity. Each case involved Black Americans being denied entrance to a public area that was privately owned, like restaurants or arboretums and gardens. According to the Civil Rights Act of 1875, it was illegal to discriminate against citizens based on their race. And you would think that that's what the 14th Amendment says. In an 8-1 decision, the Supreme Court of the time ruled that this act unconstitutional and proclaimed that private business owners should have the right to regulate who has access to their business. According to the ruling, the federal government could not make private business owners serve Black patrons. The reasoning was that the act was not backed by the 13th or 14th Amendments, although it explicitly was. 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. I am not going to get into the nitty gritty of the Southern Pacific decision because it was a complicated tax case stemming from a California law that stated railroads could not deduct, deduct the value of their mortgages from the taxable value of their property, a right that was given to individuals. And that last bit is important. Individuals were allowed to subtract a certain amount from their taxable value, which is actually still true today, to help individuals have living space. The Southern Pacific Railroad refused to pay the tax revenues involved. Several California counties sued and the case eventually wound its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court did not specifically rule on what's called corporate personhood, but a court clerk who wrote a summary of the case for the legal community stated that the ruling in favor of the railroad meant that the 14th Amendment, which forbids a state to deny equal protections to any person, also protected corporations. We kind of take the word corporation for granted as meaning company, but let's look at it for a moment. Corporation comes from the Latin corpus, meaning body. Incorporation turns a company into a body, a body that is considered a person in many respects in the eyes of the law. Corporations must pay taxes and follow laws. The meaning 
legally authorized entity, artificial person created by law from a group or succession of persons such as municipal governments and modern business companies dates back to the 1610s. So again, this is a law made in a different world with something very different in mind and also not in the United States. The way that the comment on the Southern Pacific case was worded, corporations not only had to follow the same rules as individual citizens, they got the same benefits and privileges. In this case, Southern Pacific got a benefit that was meant to ease the financial burden on city residents, although the railroads, as we have seen, were companies that were in the city for the express purpose of making money, not struggling to pay for a place to live. The comment that set this precedent was practically a footnote, but it has since taken on the safe status of settled law. 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson. Many people know about the Plessy versus Ferguson case as the separate but equal ruling and that it involved a black man in Louisiana arrested for riding in a whites only railroad car. This is all true, but it does Plessy and those who worked with him a disservice by making it seem like Homer Plessy just happened to be the poor guy arrested at the time, obscuring much of his actual investment point and goal. This man on the slide is often identified as Homer Plessy, but he is in fact PBS Penchback, who served as Louisiana governor in the 1870s before the end of Reconstruction. So why is this confusion between Plessy and Penchback so common? Part of it is that we don't have pictures of Plessy. But Penchback and Plessy were both classified by Louisiana as Black. This image on the screen here also is not Plessy. This man is Arnold Bertineau, who was also classified as Black by Louisiana. In fact, if late 19th century Louisiana had my 23 and me results, I would be classified as Black, having an ancestor about the same number of generations before me as Plessy and Bertineau. Now, obviously, I have grown up with 100% white Karen privilege. So why am I bringing this up? Because Bertineau and Plessy, along with others, were part of a group that filed case after case in an attempt to make the point that the only reason for legislation segregating schools and transportation was to create a social class who could be denied their rights and privileges. Bertineau here, by the way, filed a case on behalf of his sons who were rejected from a whites-only school. I believe that he lost the case, but don't quote me on that last part. So, Let's back up then and give Plessy and other Black activists in Louisiana, particularly New Orleans, their due as they try to stop segregation early by pointing out exactly why the laws were being created. And it wasn't as if everyone didn't actually know, but it certainly was as if everyone pretended they didn't know. The man in this image is lawyer. Rudolf L. Dedun, who published the statement quoting on quoted on the slide, which says, every honorable person knows that the law was passed to discriminate against the colored people so as to degrade them. In 1886, Dedun here and Plessy joined others to found the Justice Protective Educational and Social Club to work to ensure, as they stated that, quote, our rights as citizens of the state and of the United States are protected and respected. Homer Plessy was vice president of this group. In 1889, Louis A. Martinet, along with other members of the Justice Protective Educational and Social Club, founded the newspaper, The Crusader. The quote from Dedun in the last slide was published in The Crusader. The Crusader spoke out against violence and discriminatory treatment toward Black people. 
It denounced efforts to make distinctions between the races, arguing that Louisiana's highly mixed population made this unfeasible and put lie to the idea of segregation. The paper also closely monitored the legislature, that would be the Louisiana legislature, for new laws that chipped away at Black civil rights. And during the legislative session of 1890, the crusader focused its attention on a bill known as the Separate Car Act. This became the law later that would be challenged by Plessy, actively challenged, not just broke it. In September of 1891, a group of 18 men formed the Comité de Citoyens, or Citizens Committee, and I'll just call them the committee from now on, for the annulment of the separate car law, or as it was formerly known, Act Number 111. Representing several generations of activists, the members of the committee included business owners, teachers, writers, and lawyers. The committee's membership overlapped with the Crusader staff and membership of the Justice Protective Educational and Social Club. The committee sought to overturn the Separate Car Act through the legal system, just as the Crusader had been doing, by pointing out that unless promptly checked by the strong powers of the courts, the effects of that unconstitutional and malicious measure, that would be the Separate Car Act, will be to encourage open persecution and increase to a frightful degree opportunities for crimes and other hardships. We know that's exactly what happened. Martinet and De Dune put together the committee's strategy to challenge the constitutionality of the law through what are called test cases. In a test case, one or more people deliberately break a law in order to be arrested and bring a review of the law into the courts. The idea is that appeals made to convictions in lower courts will go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court that has the power to declare a law unconstitutional. Any person who agrees to commit the act of civil disobedience for the test case knows that they are potentially signing on for a long and difficult process. They're, as the face of the test case, they take all the hatred and vituperation that comes in. Martinet recruited two white attorneys. This is because despite the fact that he had a degree in law, as is, did De Dune, they were classed as Black. So they recruited white attorneys whom the group knew would be able to argue in any court. One of these attorneys was in New York and the other was in New Orleans. With legal representation arranged, the Citizens Committee set up two cases, two, to contest the Separate Car Act. The first case involved the planned arrest of Daydun's son, Daniel, and you can see him on the slide, on an interstate train trip. The fact that this first case was an inter state trip, meaning that it involved movement between Louisiana and another state, is important. The Citizens Committee made arrangements with the Louisiana and Nashville Railroad in advance. Now, if you're surprised that the railroad was on the side of the people protesting the Separate Car Act, unhappy with the financial burden of running two separate cars, the company agreed to participate. The committee then hired private detectives to make the arrest. Daniel Dedin's case came before Judge John Ferguson in Louisiana, who dismissed the charges in July, citing a recent decision in a Louisiana Supreme Court case. Judge Ferguson ruled that regulation of interstate travel fell under the federal government's domain, and therefore the Separate Car Act could not be applied to interstate trips. Good news, but not a test case that would effectively challenge the law. But the committee had planned for this. In the second prospective test case, the committee planned a trickier challenge by going up against intrastate travel. In this case, travel completely within the state of Louisiana. 
as in Daniel Dedun's case, the plan was to choose a white passing person to highlight the arbitrary nature of racial classifications because the Separate Car Act allowed train conductors on the spot to determine a person's race to enforce the law. On 7 June 1892, Plessy booked a ticket on the East Louisiana Railroad to travel across Lake Port Chantrain. Once again, the committee enlisted the help of the railroad company and hired a private detective to ensure Plessy's arrest. Purportedly, the plan worked so well at this point that Plessy had to notify the ticket collector that he was not white so that the complaint and then the arrest could be made. Plessy's case also landed on Judge Ferguson's docket. The Citizens Committee attorney in the case asked that the charges against his client, Plessy in this case, be dismissed, arguing that the Separate Car Act violated the 14th Amendment by making, quote, invidious distinction and discrimination based on race. It's hard to argue against that. This time, Judge Ferguson denied the argument. In November, he ruled that for travel within Louisiana, the Separate Car Act remained constitutional because equal accommodations were provided to white and black passengers. Plessy's legal team immediately appealed, sending the case before the Louisiana Supreme Court. As the Citizens Committee expected, the justices handed down a decision against Plessy and in favor of the state. This meant that the case could be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. If you just scan the part of the newspaper I show here, you will see that it mentions other similar cases that were going or had gone through lower courts. Louisiana was not alone in creating Jim Crow laws, so a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court would be taken as law in all states. Committee members understood the severe consequences that a ruling against Plessy could have for people of African descent. It would effectively give the Supreme Court's okay on Jim Crow laws, but they felt this was a risk they must take. Eight justices heard the arguments in Plessy versus Ferguson. The committee's lawyer argued that the Separate Car Act violated the 13th and 14th Amendments. By creating racial distinctions among citizens, he argued, segregated seating, quote, perpetuated the stigma of color and denied Black people equal protection under the law. Through their white lawyer, the committee pointed out the absurdity of enforcing strict racial categories given the undeniable existence of widespread racial mixture. They argued that Plessy's racial ambiguity proved that a law with the premise of separating two distinct groups, whites and coloreds in the language of the time, was untenable, meaning it made no sense and couldn't be defended. On 18 May 1896, the Supreme Court delivered its 7 to 1 decision, upholding Judge Ferguson's initial ruling that separate but equal was indeed constitutional. In a rather astounding example of what I can only describe as willful obliviousness, in the majority opinion, Justice Henry Billings Brown claimed that nothing about enforced separation stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority. If Black people felt that way, it was because they chose or choose, since he was speaking in the present, to put that construction on it. Justice John Marshall Harlan delivered the sole vote in favor of Plessy. In his dissent, Harlan disagreed with the majority's narrow interpretation of the 13th and 14th Amendments, writing that, quote, if enforced according to their true intent and meaning, the amendments will protect all the civil rights that pertain to freedom and citizenship. Furthermore, he argued that the Separate Car Act puts the brand of servitude and degradation upon a large class of our fellow citizens, our equals, before the law, which was, of course, precisely what these laws were intended to do, regardless of what the majority pretended in this case. 
the Plessy decision was monumental in a bad way, as was the seemingly endless struggle that came after. We will see civil disobedience in the pursuit of civil rights come up over and over in this class, not to mention in the America around you now. This is one of the reasons that I felt it was important to present this in a lecture dedicated to the 14th Amendment. I'm planning to do another 14th Amendment lecture covering up to the end of the 20th century, sometime closer to the end of this course. But I will bring up now that when the Supreme Court finally got around to ruling against separate but equal, in other words, overturning Plessy, they did it on the basis of separate could never be equal, not on the basis of it's wrong to separate people arbitrarily and then make a hierarchy out of that. This next case is a bit more heartening. 1898, Wong Kem Ark. In 1898, the Supreme Court affirmed the principle that children born on American soil are U.S. citizens regardless of their parents' status and that this applied to a broader group than people with African descent. Wong Kim Ark was born in San Francisco to Chinese parents, and as you are aware, by this time, anyone from China was prohibited by law from becoming a U.S. citizen. So Wong Kim Ark's parents were permanently non-citizens, but he was born in the U.S., the court ruled that birth in the U.S. outweighed other factors, such as the parent's status and conferred citizenship. The last case that we will look at here is Lochner v. New York, which goes to a topic that we have been considering all along with the rise of large-scale industrial production, the supposed freedom to negotiate a work contract. The Lochner case involved legal protections for workers, which were a new thing in the United States in the early 1900s. Lochner, a bakery owner in New York, was convicted of violating the New York Bake Shop Act, which prohibited bakers from being made to work more than 10 hours in one day and more than 60 hours in a week. The Supreme Court, in a 5-4 decision, held that the New York Bake Shop Act protecting workers was unconstitutional. The court construed the law as an absolute interference with, quote, the right of contract between the employer and employees. And then the court declared that, quote, the general right to make a contract in relation to his business is part of the liberty of the individual protected by the 14th Amendment of the Federal Constitution. The 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause prohibits states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. To the U.S. Supreme Court in 1905, the right to buy and sell labor, not people, but labor through contract was a liberty of the individual protected under the amendment. And just a quick note to say, I just keep saying the Supreme Court. You know that the Supreme Court changes membership over time because justices die. But unlike the presidency or senatorship, an appointment to the Supreme Court is an appointment for life. So change in the court tends to lag change in ideas in the bigger society. Key points for Lecture 8. Since it was written as one of the Reconstruction Amendments meant to secure the rights of Black people after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution has been interpreted and reinterpreted in major cases involving the rights of individuals. Keep an eye on the 14th Amendment, both in history and in the present. It's in the news now. It's been in the news for the last decades. The coda in this lecture addresses an astute question, astute question from a student, which I'm giving an edited form here. 
they said, I had always thought abolitionism was mainly due to enslavement being an obvious extreme civil rights issue. But in consideration of the average view white people had in the United States on Black folks, it made me think that this was not the case. Was being anti-slavery for the Republicans of the North more about disadvantaging the Southerners than prioritizing the civil rights of enslaved people? The answer is, in many cases, once the Civil War started, yes, that was the motivation, the latter one, the sticking it to the South one. But the full answer is, of course, complicated by the diversity of reasons that people had for supporting abolition of slavery in the U.S. I want to make it clear that Dakota is not making assumptions about the student who asked the question, which is a good one, but a broad response because many people, students and others, seem surprised by the virulence of racism in the North both before and after the Civil War. On the slide, you see a congressman's support for the Civil Rights Act of 1874, which did pass at the time in 1875, but which was negated by the Supreme Court in 1883 following the Cruikshank decision, as we saw in this lecture. South Carolina representative to the U.S. Congress, Robert B. Elliott, wrote, this bill does not seek to confer new rights, but simply to prevent and forbid inequality and discrimination on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It will determine the civil status not only of the Negro, as he wrote it there, but of any other class of citizens who may feel themselves discriminated against. Spot on, right? One of the first things, going back to abolition, one of the first things I will point out is that many abolitionists were Black. Textbooks tend to include people like Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, but the presentation, usually unintentionally, does not focus on Black abolitionists, abolitionists as a group on their own account. Whether intended or not, the effect is often to make Black abolitionists seem like a small side group to white abolitionists, and this is absolutely wrong. White abolitionists gave assistance to Black abolitionists, not the other way around, and the motivation of Black abolitionists was quite clearly to end a massive human rights violation that was accepted as a part of life in the United States. I often hear, not so much from UCD students, I'm happy to say, but I hear outside that slavery has been around forever. And so what happened in the U.S. wasn't out of keeping. The problem with this is that it tries to naturalize slavery in the United States, but it is not an apt comparison. No other part of the world had a system of heritable, racialized chattel slavery that bound generation after generation with no hope of escape. So this phrase, heritable racialized chattel slavery. Slavery, I think you know, chattel means object. So it's to treat enslaved people in the law as objects. Heritable racialized. If you take the 17A half of the course, if or if you take my 72A next quarter, the laws that were written early on in colonial North America deliberately enslaved the children of a woman who was enslaved. That meant her children in perpetuity could never be free. With that in mind, there were white abolitionists sincerely dedicated to the cause of abolition because they understood slavery as a crime against fellow humans. John Brown, the Grimke sisters, and William Lloyd Garrison are examples that you will see often. With the exception of Brown, who fought slavery in the quite literal physical sense, most of this sort of white abolitionist used a technique called moral suasion. And yes, it is suasion and not 
persuasion. Basically, moral suasion involved pointing out repeatedly and with examples that the enslavement of people was objectively wrong. I will point out here that being against slavery and brutality as moral wrongs does not preclude a person being racist. If you go through the work of even the most devoted white abolitionists, you will eventually find a racist statement. To say that the U.S. was so steeped in racism that it was inescapable is to point out a reality. It is absolutely not to excuse the actions or words of people at the time, but to turn that same lens on our society and ourselves now because the U.S. is still steeped in racism. So that's the white abolitionist who made ending slavery their life cause. But there were many white people who were against slavery for economic reasons. White industrialists did not want an enslaved workforce that they would need to maintain. Immigrants were pouring into the U.S., and it was more cost-efficient to the industries to pay the immigrants super low wages and just replace them with fresh workers on a regular basis. White workers were against slavery because it brought down their wages, or they believed that it would do so. A prime example of this was the so-called Free Soil Party that was active in the actions over the free versus slave states that preceded the American Civil War. Most Free Soilers were extremely racist. It literally was the soil, the new states, that they wanted to be free of slavery. The motivation was not the situation of enslaved people. For a brief time, there was actually a free soil party as opposed to just active free soilers. And the political party's motto was free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. The free soilers nominated Martin Van Buren for president. In contrast to abolitionists who opposed slavery on moral grounds, most free soilers opposed slavery because they felt that white laborers should not have to compete with nor be, quote, degraded by the presence of enslaved Black people in the new territories. In fact, a plank or one of the, the central goals of the party, a plank to include Black suffrage in the party platform was voted down by the Free Soilers. In representing anti-slavery as an issue of self-interest to whites, Free Soilism actually did what all the moral suasion in the world was not able to do. And it made anti-slavery for the first time a viable political movement in the North. We discussed in live lecture the fact that political arguments are complicated by the fact that people use words that may strictly mean the same thing in a dictionary, but by which the speakers actually mean quite different things. Independence, freedom, abolition, and civil rights had a very different meaning in practical terms for the Black members of Congress shown on the slide than the words had for many of their white colleagues. And this also goes to the failure of Reconstruction.